Tag time. No worries. Bingo. All righty. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'd like to call to order the March 16th, 2022 board mm -hmm. meeting and remind everyone to please mute your audio when not speaking, as well as state your name prior to making a comment or motion and a second for an action item. We'll begin by asking each commissioner to please respond with a hear when I call out their name. Commissioner Bagnell. I am here. Good evening. Commissioner Thank Doan. You. I am here also. Good evening as well. Uh, Commissioner Duggan. Here. Good evening, neighbor. And Commissioner Schmidt. Here. Good evening. Wonderful. Let's start out this evening with a report from our Chief Executive Officer and Management Staff. Thank you and good evening. Um, let me uh, make sure I'm going to the right side here. Uh, all right. Uh, Portland Crypto Squidium results for the month of February 2022. Uh, the Portland Water Bureau reported two crypto spiritiumosis detections in water samples collected from the Bull Run Headworks. Portland Water Bureau will continue increased sampling four times per week until there are at least three weeks without any detections. The Oregon Health Authority has determined that the public does not need to take additional protections at this time. Uh, complete results of Portland's crypto spreading and monitoring are posted on the city's website. Uh, so um, this next, I got a couple slides here, and, and this is uh, in response to a request from Commissioner Doan uh, to uh, know the status of where we're at with the class compensation study and, and kind of what, what we're doing and where we're going. Um, so, uh, I, I'm going to read through these and, and please feel free to ask questions uh, as they come up. Um, so the Tualatin Valley Water District, we has done comparison of jobs on a case by case basis with regional entities over the years. So it's not been uh, it's not been necessarily consistent, um, but we we've over the years um, we've done some looking uh, to get some feel for it. Uh, what I want to make clear is that that work is not the equivalent of a what a comprehensive class compensation study is. Um, the last time the district undertook a, a true comprehensive class comp study was in 1993. Uh, the last significant study was done in 2006 um, but it didn't have all of the elements of a full class comp study. Um, and so what are the elements? Well, a full class comp study includes assessing the district's compensation system, reviewing and updating job descriptions for each job, uh, determining appropriate comparable entities, um, evaluating compensation in the market to changes made with job classification systems. So. There's a number of steps uh, involved. Um, probably one of the more important steps, um, in, in my opinion, that, that needs to occur is there on, on some sort of regular basis, there needs to be a reconciliation of a person's job with the manager. Because what happens to people over time, uh, especially outstanding employees, is, hey, you did great work on this. Um, we, are you willing to take this on? Um, right, how about this? Will you take this on? And, and it doesn't take very long um, before somebody who is doing a job has a lot more responsibility than what their job actually says, and it doesn't necessarily get recognized. And so doing this reconciliation on a regular basis where you actually sit down and you have the manager review the job and you have the employee review the job 
And what you end up with in the times I've done this uh, more frequently than not, you have an employee who says, here's all the things I'm doing and a manager who's going, oh, I didn't know you were doing all that. I thought you were just doing this. Um, so, um, you know, that's why you do these. So that that's one of the important steps in this process. That then leads to understanding when I'm comparing a particular job, does that job, you know, whatever that title is, is it truly a real comparable? So in other words, let, let me use a, an example here. Um, if I'm taking a water operator and I say, I'm going to compare this water operator job to a water operator over in a neighboring entity. Well, um, the first challenge I have is the neighboring entity oftentimes has water operator one, water operator two, water operator three, <laughs> sometimes four, and I've even seen it go up to five. Um, so we don't we don't have that. Um, we we have the generic you know what water operator, and we don't you know we recognize in terms of compensation. Um, over time, their pay goes up within that within that uh, job, but it makes it really hard to compare is the point. Um, and then if they have responsibilities within their job description that aren't actually a direct comparable, you don't you're you're not you don't have a direct comparable. It makes it really hard to compare. So that's why that job uh, looking at the job in, in um, Getting both the manager and the employee to agree on what that what the job is that somebody's doing. That's a really critical first step in the process. Then you look at the comparables. Um, so let me go to the next slide here. So um, uh, here's where we're at in the timeline. Uh, we, our goal is to have a consultant uh, begin work by the end of May. Uh, on this, on the comp study. Um, and I just mentioned the managers and staff review the job descriptions and do this comparison. That's really the first thing out of the gates that you typically do. Um, and then the other thing that we need is a, a list, a recommended list of comparable entities. We're in a very different job market today than what we have been historically. So people are far more willing to move. Um, they're far more willing to, uh, you know, look at places outside their hometowns. And so we need to look at what are the comparables? Who are we trying to attract when we're trying to attract talent? Um, so, uh, you know, we can we can certainly point to even people on this call um, where they came from outside the area. So we want to make sure that it's not that we're just competitive within this region. We want to make sure that we're trying we're, when we are uh, looking for talent that we're drawing talent from outside the region too. So we got to come up with this list of comparables and the board needs to, along with uh, staff, we, we need to uh, agree on what that list of comparables is and adopt that as policy and say, these are who we're comparing to. Um, and then, uh, then we need to uh, review the compensation class. So this is looking at you know, I tried to simplify the argument here, but we have a very broad pay band um, with very few job descriptions um, compared to a really narrow pay band with a lot of job descriptions. Um, there's pros and cons to both, um, but uh, we need to take a close look at that and, um, you know, reevaluate. Do we want to stick with our current band of, of of the way things are structured or do, or do we want to do we want to go to something that's mo a more narrow band the benefit of a narrow band is it provides more opportunity for um increasing uh your you know chain going up inside the existing organization um so 
Uh, let me give you a, a, an example. I'm going to stick with the water operator example, but there's many examples. So if we have we currently have a water operator um, you know, position, but if if you had a water operator one, water operator two, three, four, if that's if that is the model we adopt, right? Well, water operator one would have a certain level of cer certification certification required. Two would have a higher level. Three has a higher level. Four has a higher level. So you're you're creating an incentive for an employee then to get additional certifications um, to climb up in those grades and steps, which which a lot of places do. Um, so I'm just giving you a contrast there, um, but we have to we have to work on that. Um, and then uh, we have to uh, review the pay structure, including the compensation formula. We're going to be talking more about this later tonight. Um, but the you know really understanding you know merit versus cola, and I would argue what we have today we we blended these two. Um, it's not to say it's wrong. It's just very different um, than what you typically see, um, and it comes with its own set of complications. And we're gonna we'll be talking about that later tonight. Um, and then ultimately. When the as we work through all this process, we got to be working with our staff. This can't be done in a vacuum, right? This isn't something you have the consultant go do and you come back with results and and then tell the staff, okay, here's how you're impacted. That that is a re I've seen that done. It's a really poor way to do a compensation study. This is something that you have to work with staff through the process. Um, and and you got to you got to develop the buy in with staff and you got to maintain it as you go through. We've all, I'll talk more about that here in a minute, but we've been working on that already. Um, so you you have to have the staff participation. If you don't have the staff participation and, and engagement on this, you you end up with something that's not not a good result typically. Um, and then. At the end, we got to develop an implementation strategy. Um, the first part of all this work gives us data. It gives us information. The second part is figuring out how we implementing this. Um, you know, we 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 gotta we gotta be smart about implementing this. Um, whatever whatever the findings are, we gotta we gotta be smart about it. Um, so you know, I've broken out that that's all the work that the staff will be doing. Um, certainly, we're going to be asking the board to weigh in on some policy decisions in all of this. Um, one being, which we're going to talk about later tonight, is the COLA. And, and you know, is there, do, is there a limit? Do we want limits? What, what you know, those, those kinds of things. Um, tonight is not uh, the formal process that we're going to be going through in terms of the comp study, but it's the beginning of a conversation around it. Um, the board needs to weigh in on the comparable entities. Um, the board needs to agree that whatever we're comparing to, that there's agreement there, um, that the board feels like, yeah, those 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 are entities we should be comparing to. And then ultimately, um, I really think the board needs to develop a policy uh, that um, defines the frequency of future comp studies um, so that that's embedded in in the policies so that I would argue um, I think uh, you know a comp study like this should be done at least every five years um, it that way job descriptions don't start to diverge from the actual job um you 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 keep those in line with each other and it's not as heavy of a lift if you do it every few years so um what have we done uh so the process um we've worked with staff uh to develop an understanding and need for the comp study um so we've had a lot of conversations with staff about this um because this isn't something you want to Again, it, I, I will argue that this is part of my philosophy 
um, that you you don't just simply go tell staff this is happening to you. Um, I I don't I just think that's not responsible. So we we have spent a lot of time engaging with staff, having conversations with staff, getting them to understand the need. As part of that, we developed uh, talking points working with staff, um, and that we've provided those talking points to all staff. You know, why are we doing this? What's the goal? Um, you know, how do they get to weigh in? What's that? all look like so we we have done those things um we are currently developing the rfp for services um i'm hoping if, if we're going to have them on board by the end of may uh, obviously we need to get this on the street um at some point in april so that's the goal is to get the rfp on the street at some point in april i'm i'm hoping for mid-april um, and then uh, we got to begin work with the consultant by the end of May. The time frame for this work, um, it's quite a bit. It's a heavy lift. Um, you're talking about an, somewhere in the neighborhood of nine to 12 months. Could it be sooner? Maybe. Um, uh, but I, I look at staff's own workload that we already have, and this requires staff's participation. So I think trying to push it faster is really putting pressure on our own staff more than it is the consultant. Um, again, this this is some this is work you do in conjunction with the consultant. You don't do it uh, alone. So um, that's to tell you that that's where we're at in in the comp say. So we're, we're we're at the beginning of this. Um, this is this is this has really been already uh, the conversations we've had with staff um, have been great. Frankly, um, I think staff understands the need for this at this point. Um, they 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 get it, um, and they 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 get the rationale of why this has to be done and the timing of it, um, and they also acknowledge it's it's a pain. Um, this is typically, you know, this isn't, this isn't fun work. Uh, this isn't, you know, um, and frankly, anytime you do a class comp study, you'll hear many HR people tell you, well, everybody thinks they're getting a pay raise um, when you do a class comp study. Um, you know, that's part of what we want to make sure is that there's clear expectations here that there's no, we're not telling everybody this is going to result in something magnificent. We we don't know. We haven't done this in a long time, so um, this has to get done. And so that's where we're at. Uh, I hope uh, Commissioner Dome this this uh, provides a some some level uh, of of satisfaction of where we're at in the process and where we're going. And I and I open the door to any questions you you have on this. Okay. Commissioner Doan, go, go ahead. Tom, this is Jim Doan. What do you think this uh, study is going to cost? Um, I'm trying to remember what we've budgeted for this, and I'm going to call ask Paul to to weigh in. But I, I it's I'm going to say in the neighborhood of about two hundred thousand bucks. Okay. That's but uh, I I don't know I don't remember exactly what we budgeted. All right. Um, earlier, you said you used the pronoun he for the consultant, and I assume that uh, that was inadvertent. It was. I apologize. Um, OK. Yeah. Well, I look forward to getting on with this. Uh, so do I, 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 I. I do want to point out if I if I can, I mean, Obviously, uh, we've had some changes in turnover in HR, um, and that threw a bit of a wrinkle in all of this, uh, you know, in terms of, of the timing on this. Right now, uh, Paul and myself are the main owners of this work, um, and we're 
we're, we're trying to get it to align uh, a bit with the mission, vision, and values work that we're also doing. Um, we do have uh, our new HR analyst uh, has started, um, and she's joined the team. She's working with Catherine Cruz. Um, we have uh, the next HR person will be starting here end of May, I believe, or beginning of June. Um, and uh, at some point, we'll we'll have them in front of the board so um, uh, they can meet you. But uh, the uh, and you can meet them. Uh, but uh, I one of the things that I didn't want to do is tell brand new HR people first day on the job. Oh, here, go get this done. Uh, let me know when you got it done. Uh, so this was something that. Uh, I would prefer to have HR have ownership over completely, but um, with tone turnover that we've had, this is something that uh, I'm going to be owning and I will slowly be bringing HR in on this as we go through it. Uh, but it, they're involved, but I'm not asking them to do all the heavy lift at this point. All right, any other questions? Thank you, Tom. This is Jim Doan. All right. All right, well, let's move on then. So uh, I'm going to turn this over to Paul Matthews and uh, our chief financial officer, and he's going to present the safety minute. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I I'll just start his safety minute out by saying uh, I, I had a very scary close call uh, early Monday morning, and uh, so this daylight savings time thing is very real. So, uh, <laughs> so Paul, take it away. All right, thank you, Tom. Yeah, so uh, in the spirit of being just a little bit late, which is what uh, daylight savings time change in spring tends to have me do. Uh, I thought I'd present this as as our safety minute a few days after the change. So as, as you probably realized on Sunday morning, we went from uh, from standard time to daylight savings time here in Oregon. And interestingly enough, I didn't notice it because all of my devices reset their their clocks themselves with one exception. And that would be my body's clock. And just like every human being and probably other animals, so I didn't research that. I just look at the Homo sapiens. We have uh, something called the circadian rhythms, which I'm sure you're all aware of, uh, which is oriented around our sleep, but also affects things like our digestive system, heart uh, functions. Uh, a lot of those things are tied into this rhythm uh, that is part of our body's clock. And uh, part of the problem when we switch to daylight savings time is it alters that rhythm. And it can affect our physical well-being, it can affect our mental outlook, and it can affect our behavior. So, uh, for example, uh, there are more car accidents on the Sunday, uh, Sunday, Monday morning after the daylight savings time switches because our bodies aren't ready for it, and we get up an hour earlier, and, and we tend to be a little bit grumpier. In the fall, uh, some of us react maybe a little bit differently because we get a little bit more sleep. But there are a couple things that we can do. Uh, in fact, five things I found in an article uh, at everydayhealth.com uh, suggesting that we can do to help us with that transition as we move from standard time to daylight savings time. First one is consistency, and that is before you get into uh, the time where you are switching, get your sleep regular, have a regular sleep schedule, and that will reduce uh, the impact on your body that moving uh, to daylight savings time will be. And my, my doctor calls a good sleep hygiene. I'm horrible at it, but uh, having good consistent sleep schedule will help you. And then uh, start gradually shifting your sleep uh, before uh, the week before daylight saving time switch. Well, that would have required me to know that it was happening this Sunday, but had I known that, and if I had the discipline of good sleep hygiene, I could have started 15 minutes per day beforehand, just gradually shifting my sleep as we approach that Sunday morning uh, when we are uh, changing over. Uh, the other thing they recommend is actually changing your dinner schedule uh, because that all sets up part of our 
the circadian rhythm. And so adjust that 15 minutes per day so you can get that major uh, part of your life in order. That then helps you uh, with the good sleep hygiene and it helps you shift your sleeping schedule as well. Uh, they also suggest that you switch all of your clocks. And this was the interesting thing. This was the first time I woke up, went to church. Everything happened normally on Sunday morning. I didn't realize until I got home. My wife said, you know, daylight savings time had switched because literally every device in our house now that I look at regularly from my phone, my watch, um, my uh, uh, my clock radio and my car and their computers, they all switch automatically so uh, but if you have those old devices that need to be switched consider switching those devices the night before and get you kind of thinking about what's what's coming and then the uh, last item is to start your day with sunlight there's something about sunlight getting yourself exposed to sunlight early in the morning it helps the body uh, readjust to those rhythms so that is uh, it for the safety moment and again it's important to make these shifts so you don't end up in that perilous situation that Tom was describing where I think, Tom, if I'm not mistaken, you may have fallen asleep as you were driving or something along. No, a driver coming at you had fallen asleep. That's right. Um, I got that backwards. Um, but with that, I'm going to switch into uh, the department report. If there are no questions or comments on uh, daylight savings time. Uh, Paul, this is Dick. Yes, uh, we live in Willamette Valley. What sunshine? <laughs> you know, what I moved hey, to uh, Oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Doan. This is, yeah. Um, the Senate voted yesterday to go to daylight savings time all year round. It, it doesn't appear likely that the House will go along with it, but, um, you know, who knows? Uh, I certainly would encourage it. But uh, there's all kinds of reasons when we tried it in the mid 70s that it sort of blew apart. But I think that was mostly hatred of Richard Nixon. So uh, anyway, I'll just be quiet now. Yeah, I, I this is Dick. I agree. Uh, uh, staying on daylight savings time would be just fine with me. Okay, so uh, for my department report, this is going to be a short report. Some may say I mailed it in because I've been working on a lot of other things right now, but I wanted to highlight uh, some of the things, the challenges that the finance department has faced during this era of COVID-19, and then I want to touch on a personal note uh, that I have. And so, first of all, I, I could not be more proud of, of our team. Uh, you know, we showed up on a Monday morning back, I think it was March 16th of 2020, and we told everybody to go home, figure out how they were going to pay all the bills, pay all of our employees, uh, do our financial reporting, and 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 essentially do the district's financial business remotely as we were all trying to understand how to deal with the COVID-19 virus. And, uh, and they did it, and they found ways to do their jobs uh, that were very interesting, a uh, very, uh, you know, they, they just simply got the work done. It would have been very easy for people to have said, well, I can't do this because I don't have this, that, or the other thing. Instead, they came up with ways to accomplish the mission. And so just kudos to them and their professionalism. And I think we saw that throughout the district. It's not unique to the finance department, but um, they're the group that I get to brag about. So so that's why I'm doing that. And uh, again, it couldn't be, couldn't be more, more proud. Uh, but one of the challenges that we saw is we've, had new positions come up and we've had retirements and so forth is actually the challenge of onboarding staff when you have a, a COVID-19 you're working remotely. And we immediately recognized the onboarding of staff as being a, a real challenge. And so we were very deliberate about that. Supervisors worked incredibly closely. We planned well in advance of retirements and had overlaps and did everything we could to document workflow because we knew that the natural sort of team that would be around them was going to be dispersed. And so we took a very deliberate uh, approach. Uh, and of course, onboarding should always be a deliberate approach. I'm not saying that uh, during non-COVID times it isn't. We've always taken a deliberate approach, but I'm just saying in this case, it was more than normal. And, and, and in fact, we have successfully onboarded our employees. Uh, having said that, one of the other things that we wanted to do is to keep that team building effort that brings people together uh, the human side of of our team. And building that team 
happens naturally when you're all in the same building together. You have lunch together, you go on walks together, you see each other in the hallway. Uh, and that's an important part of people feeling that they belong within the organization is to have that camaraderie. And so we were trying to find ways of doing that. And so in our, our department meetings, we purposely developed uh, uh, what you might call icebreakers. And we've done three of them uh, over the course of, of the pandemic. The first one was just something interesting about you. So we went around to everybody within our group. Uh, each uh, we would meet each week and they would they would give a report out on something interesting about that was kind of interesting fun. So I reported that when I uh, was a senior in high school, I had curly hair, a full head of hair, naturally curly hair, things of that nature that people wouldn't necessarily know. And then the next thing we did is we played a game called Two Lies and a Truth. It didn't take a lot of time to do these things either. So I want to give you the impression we waste a lot of time at work playing games. But it was important to bring the team together. And so the way the two lies and truth worked is we each thought up two lies and then one thing that was truthful. And we put that into um, a random generator. And then each of our department meetings, we would go out and we'd say, here, here are the these three facts. And uh, the game was then to identify who it was and which was true and which ones were false. And it was uh, a lot of fun. And I think it contributed to that camaraderie. And then the last thing that we're doing now, and we're wrapping that up, is uh, we didn't know what it was called. It was it's called Picha Kucha. I think I'm saying that correctly. It's a Japanese word, as I understand. I don't speak Japanese. Uh, I barely speak English, but it uh, means chit chat in Japanese. And um, uh, we were doing this, and we just asked everybody to come up with a slide deck and talk about what they do that's uh, an important thing about them. Um, and it, it varies in length. It, we usually spend about actually 10 minutes, um, investing 10 minutes of our, our time with our colleagues to learn about them. And some of them have just been fascinating things that we've learned and insight. They get to tell people the kinds of things that they might uh, hear around the the water cooler or or the coffee machine, whatever it is that you uh, that your pleasure is. And so I, I went to the Oregon Government Finance Officer Association um, conference. It's the first live conference I've been in since the uh, pandemic hit. And the keynote speaker talked about this Picha Kucha. And I thought, wow, we're brilliant people. We came up with this all by ourselves. Here we are, we're doing this thing. And we didn't know how advanced we were. And I came back and bragged to one of our staff members, Christy, and she said, yeah, where do you think I got the idea? She'd gone to a conference uh, on procurement and the same speaker had been there. So I feel a little deflated, but it really did work. It was a great idea. And actually Christy has been such an important part of, of helping us do these this team building exercise. She has a strong interest in a, and, and a great sense of those things. Uh, but that's what we've done to keep the team built together. We really do need to get back together and we've got a plan to do that. Um, but those are the three things that we did. And the other thing that we did, frankly, is is throughout the pandemic is we really emphasized that we needed to have an ethic of respect for each other. We have a lot of folks that have different views on matters related to the pandemic. Uh, that's how our our diverse society works. That's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. We appreciate all the different views that people have, uh, but we have to do that in a respectful way. And we emphasize that uh, to try to minimize any uh, kind of conflict around those things, especially uh, you probably remember there was a time when this was much more controversial. Uh, and uh, we always came back to that North Star that we're going to respect each other. We're going to allow uh, for differences and um, and and we put our common uh, our, our common interest in promoting the district's financial health that always kind of uh, rose above that. So that was one thing. And the other thing we did is we celebrate each other and that was part of these three things that we've that we've done but we also uh took time just to to honor each other and 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 to go out of our way to understand that that's an important part of people belonging to to the organization and uh along that front i've, I've got one more thing i want to talk about here and it, it's it this is not a um uh you know this is one of those mixed emotional things uh one of our co-workers uh who, who uh, retired Back in uh, 2019, she was uh, killed uh, earlier this year in a traffic accident. And 
Uh, so uh, we we want to honor her, and I, I just want to take a little bit of time here tonight to talk about Renee Ogletree. She was an accounting technician here at the district. Uh, she uh, worked at the district for 11 years. Uh, during that 11 year period of time, she paid over 50,000 invoices for more than $400 million. Um, and um, she was about five foot nothing in height, and she was one of the more sarcastic people that you could meet. She was a wonderful person who could break the ice when we were in meetings. Uh, she was uh, that that um, spark plug that would allow us to uh, emerge past whatever we thought was important when in fact the human relationships are actually in the end the things that we cherish the most. So I have three pictures here of Renee and a few weeks back um, in the Thursday memo I included a uh, the paycheck news article that we that we put together to celebrate Renee and and how important she was to uh, our organization and to some of uh, the folks who worked with her and how um, we are we're happy that we knew Renee and that she was part of our team and she was part of our lives but um, losing somebody like Renee at 69 is is really um, painful for us so uh, with that uh, that concludes my department report. I just wanted to uh, celebrate Renee as well. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, the next item will be our commissioner communications and the reports of meetings attended. Uh, we'll begin this evening with, surprise, surprise, Commissioner Bagnell. It's really cool to be right at the front of the alphabet. <laughs> so I don't have too many things to report on. The first is that on the 1st of March, we had a board work session where Roy Rogers from the Washington County Commission visited us and we got our update on the Willamette water supply system. And we also talked at great length about flags and flagpoles. On the 10th, I had a meeting with our CFO, our CEO and Commissioner Duggan to do a finance committee meeting where we talked about uh, the COLA and the inflation and how it is affecting rates and raises as well. And then, of course, tonight's meeting, the regular board meeting. And that's it. Thank you, Commissioner Bagnell. Commissioner Doan? Yes, thank you. Uh, on the first, uh, I attended the same work session that most people did. On the 10th, uh, you and Tom, uh, we had a meeting to, to discuss uh, where we go from here with masking updates. And then tonight's regular meeting. Indeed. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Doan. Commissioner Duggan. <clears throat> uh, for this month, uh, on the day after our last regular meeting, um, there was a special meeting of the Willamette Water Supply System Board. Uh, it was on uh, February 17th, um, where we approved the water treatment plant uh, guaranteed maximum price contract. On the first, I uh, also attended the, the board uh, work session where we uh, met with uh, Commissioner Roy Rogers, uh, got an update on the WWSS and the, the flagpole. Um, on the third, uh, I attended the regular uh, board meeting of the WWSS. On the eighth, I had a meeting with uh, uh, CEO Tom Hickman and our president uh, Sanders uh, to plan for tonight's meeting. Um, on the tenth, there was the meeting of the, the finance committee that Commissioner Bagdell mentioned, and then tonight's meeting. So that's my report for March. Thank you, Commissioner Duggan. And it looks like a freshly shaved Commissioner Schmidt. 
is the beard is gone. Did we lose Dick? The beard is gone, but the mute is off. But the mute is on. Dick, you need to do your thing. It's a really, really quiet report. I show Dick, his microphone. You need to unmute. <laughs> his microphone's off. Yeah. I, are, I'm sorry. Are you addressing me? And I, I had to step away for a moment. So no, uh, we are. Um, we're waiting for Commissioner Schmidt. Um, he does show up as a guest on our list, uh, but he was having some audio problems earlier before the meeting. And I wonder if that, uh, if the gremlins haven't returned. And unfortunately team settings are such that we are not allowed to unmute other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause he was, he was on video just a couple minutes ago and, and he's no longer on video either. So I wonder if, um, some of the computer issues he was having oh, just before he, the meeting. He's still on video and connected. I suspect it's just a uh, unmute button location issue. All righty. He has also submitted his form to me, so if you if you needed to run quickly through what he sent out, I could go ahead and do that for him. Okay. Do you want to send him a quick note and see if he's able to um, get his audio working or if he wants Debbie to read it? I saw your note, Tim. I will text that to him. Yeah. Am I on? Hello? Yes, there's there's two instances of let's do this. Commissioner Schmidt, try try speaking now. Hello. <laughs> You're in the meeting twice, Debbie. Can you remove one of the uh, the the muted version of Commissioner Schmidt? Yes. Okay. Now does it work? Yes. Yes. Okay. Finally. Dick, do you have any meetings to report? Uh, yes, I have two. I have uh, the uh, work session on the first of the month and tonight. And that's it for me. <clears throat> All right. Thank you, Commissioner Schmidt. Uh, I am the last member here to this evening, and so um, I will report on uh, February 28th. Um, I met with uh, our lobbyist, Norm Eater, and Tom Hickman, and we went over the outcomes of the uh, lobbying effort that was made earlier um, this winter down in Salem. Uh, and then I met on the first with Tom to discuss some of the future goal planning for the district. 
the eighth meeting, which is was our board agenda meeting with myself and Commissioner Duggan and um, CEO Tom Hickman. And then on the 10th, the meeting that Commissioner Doan had mentioned where uh, we met with a couple of the members of the leadership team and talked about the COVID plan update. Uh, also on the 10th, there was a very short JWC executive committee meeting, um, which ended up not really happening because they didn't have quorum. Um, and then tonight's meeting. So that would be it for me. All righty. Uh, next item then are topics to be raised by the commissioners. And I will ask, um, do we have any topics to be raised by the commissioners? Not hearing any, um, the next item will be our public comment, where public comment time is set aside for persons wishing to address the board on items that the consent agenda and matters not on the agenda. Additional public comment will be invited on agenda items as they are presented. Do we have any persons who would like to comment this evening? Okay, not hearing any then, I will move on to our next agenda item, which is our consent agenda. The consent agenda items are considered to be routine and may be enacted in one motion without separate discussion. Any board members may request that an item be removed by motion for discussion and separate action. Any items requested to be removed from the consent agenda for separate discussion will be considered immediately after the board has approved those items which do not require discussion. This evening, we are looking to approve via consent agenda the February 16th, 2022 regular meeting minutes and to approve the March 1st, 2022 work session minutes and also to adopt resolution 03-22 a resolution endorsing the annexation of the Tualatin Valley Water District of a single property. Uh, let me read that over again, please. Uh, we're going to adopt resolution 03-22, a resolution endorsing the annexation to the Tualatin Valley Water District of a single property located at tax lot 400, Township 1, North Range 2 West, Section 14 of the Willamette Meridian at 21727 Northwest West Union Road in Washington County. Do I have a motion and a second to, appro to approve the consent agenda as presented? This is Commissioner Duggan, so moved. And this is Commissioner Bagnell, I second. Thank you. I'd like to ask our district recorder to please provide a roll call. Commissioner oh. Bagnell? Yes. Commissioner Doan? Yes. Commissioner Duggan? Yes. Commissioner Sanders? Yes. Commissioner Schmidt? Yes. Fantastic. The motion passes. Um, next item on our agenda this evening is the business agenda where we will be considering adopting resolution 04-22, a resolution amending the intergovernmental agreement between Washington County and the Tualatin Valley Water District for construction of water line work on Southwest Tualatin Valley Highway at Southwest 211th to Southwest 209th Avenues and Southwest 209th Avenue Southwest Alexander to Southwest Kinnaman Road. For this, we'll have a staff report by Nick Augustus. Nick. Thank you. Good evening, uh, President Sanders, members of the board. Uh, it's my pleasure to present this IGA amendment. Um, you might recognize it. We uh, actually presented on it um, 
uh, last year around this time and several things have changed uh, since then and which is why we wanted to bring it to the board at this time. Um, let's see. All right, did that advance it? This slide. Yeah. Yes. OK, great. Um, all right, so the Washington County uh, IGA scope extents. I uh, just wanted to go over those again with a little map here. Um, that extends on uh, Tualatin Valley Highway uh, from 209th Avenue to 211th Avenue, and then uh, north-south direction. There's a lot of work that will be done from uh, Southwest Alexander Street to Southwest Kinnaman Road. Um, a lot of this, uh, the the intersection right there, if, if you've been in the area, the railroad tracks are right there near the intersection. And, and so the one of the priorities for the county is to raise the intersection to meet the grade of those tracks. And so uh, we uh, would like to take the opportunity to uh, replace some pipe that otherwise would be very deep following uh, the construction there. Uh, we, we have some old piping in the area and, and um, the condition on it is not great. Uh, so some of the details of, of the IGA amendment include um, the, the county's desire to construct roadway improvements, uh, raising the grade significantly. Uh, we do have uh, several different water lines that, that will be impacted by this work. And we've performed some uh, condition assessment of the pipelines and would like to replace those at this time. Uh, it's a lot easier when the county has all the traffic control set up and, and we're able to do, uh, enter the roadway at the same time and, and have those improvements done. Um, and then uh, one big change uh, since the last time we presented is we have additional conflicts uh, with piping uh, that, that conflict with the county's uh, storm water design along uh, Southwest 209th Avenue. And these conflicts, as is, is much as we've we've tried to avoid them, or un unfortunately, we're, we're not able to avoid all of them. So we do have some uh, a portion of our 30-inch pipeline that will need to be relocated, as well as uh, several hundred feet of 12-inch pipeline. And uh, due to these changes, the cost of the project has exceeded the value of the original IGA, and which is a uh, main reason why we wanted to, to bring this back to your attention. A uh, couple of details regarding the cost of, of the IGA. Uh, the, the original IGA cost was 856,000 plus some proportional lump sum items. And uh, currently, we're estimating the total project cost at two million eighteen thousand two hundred eight, um, give or take a little bit. Um, the The total spend to date is fifty two thousand five hundred, and the total IGA that that was uh, signed by the county is one million six hundred seventy three thousand, and that includes the design work. Uh, since that time. The bids were actually received on the IGA or on on this work, and the the cost of that IGA is actually one million eight hundred seventy four thousand. Uh, so it went up a little bit. Um, this is being funded through Fund Eleven, uh, which is our uh, capital improvements fund, and under the line item pipeline upgrades and renewals, agency driven, and. With this, there, there's been uh, some shifting around of, of the county projects. They've had a couple of them have been delayed. Um, and because of because of those delays, uh, we don't anticipate a need to increase uh, our biennial budget at this time. We believe we'll be able to manage within that line item uh, still just due to the 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 county workflow and and there's several projects they're waiting on on uh, right-of-way acquisitions that that will push the expenditures into the next biennium and with that are there any questions 
I just wanted to add one more comment to um, this agenda item, and that is um, there are, uh, you know, Nick did a super job of explaining all of the changes that have occurred, but one of the things that um, I think we need to be cognizant of is these county driven projects will continue to happen and the cost improve the uh, cost increases that we're experiencing um, is going to again continue to happen and unfortunately um, even though Nick is super good looking he is not able to um, get the county to stick with their original budget so we just want you to be aware that when um, these changes happen we like for you to be aware of them and um, know that, you know, we don't really have a lot of choice, but the cost increases are happening for a lot of various reasons. And he does look very nice. Good job, Nick. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> oh, yeah, if anybody who has driven down that road knows of that hump right there at the tracks and um, can envision that being a complicated little corner because you also have TV highway has like this little steep little slope right there. It's only like a hundred yards long, but it gets steep to join in there with Kinnaman or not Kinnaman, um, 209th, and then it flattens out again. Um, and that also that in that road, isn't that the, I guess the Eastern boundary of what is now the new South Hillsboro area? Yes. Yep. So I would imagine that it became a lot more complex than it used to be. So it's unfortunate uh, reality of another million dollars. Um, maybe that is that why the suit is on because you were bringing us uh, <laughs> the news. Yeah. yeah. Make sure you you knew it was a pricey endeavor. <laughs> Indeed. All right. Well, thank you, Nick. Um, if there are no other questions, uh, do we have a motion and a second to adopt approving amendment number one to the intergovernmental agreement between Washington County and the Tualatin Valley Water District um, for the construction work on water line, for the construction of water line work on South TV Highway and 209th Avenue. This would be the resolution 04-22. This is Commissioner Bagnall, I so move. This is Commissioner Doan, I uh, second. Can the district recorder please provide a roll call vote? Com Commissioner Bagnall? Yes. Commissioner Doan? Yes. Commissioner Duggan? Yes. Commissioner Sanders? Yes. Commissioner Schmidt? Yes. All right, the motion passes. We used to drive through that intersection all the time for our kids to play soccer at the school there on 209th. So I remember hating that intersection. Anyway, the motion does pass. And um, our next item, is to consider providing staff with direction for flags to be displayed at the district headquarters. And um, this evening's presentation will be provided by Carrie Pack. Good evening, commissioners. Um, thank you for having me back. I told you you couldn't get rid of me that quickly. Um, actually, Matt Oglesby is on his way down to Cancun for a well-deserved vacation. So. I um, decided to step in and I realized that I didn't do a whole lot of present preparation for this other than to remind you that we came to the board um, on March in March 1st. And as you a couple of you have already noted, um, we had a very robust discussion about this issue. And one of the um, outcome of that robust discussion was um, Commissioner Duggan's suggestion of why not keep the one of the existing um, poll and uh, arrange the the um, flags in a way with three polls. And so that is exactly what we did. We thought that was a great suggestion. And we did a um, um, rendering of what that could look like. And thanks to Commissioner Doan, 
who's um, who pointed out that we had the order of flags um, flying at a in the wrong order um, from the previous presentation that you may have seen the slide that you may have seen. So what we're, what you're looking at right now is um, three flags, three required flags that are flying um, with the two new poles that will be um, matching the height at the top of the existing pole that actually already sits on a concrete pedestal. So the two new poles will be a little bit taller in length, but at the end of the day, they will all be um, even at the top of the flagpole. So they won't look odd, you know, in the differential in the in the height of them. And um, so with these arrangement, the arrangement that we have that we're showing here on this slide, it gives us the ability to um, fly all of the required flags um, by the state. It also gives us other opportunities, as you can see, because the flags, the two new poles will be taller. We have additional opportunities to fly different flags if that's what the board wanted to do. And what we wanted to talk about today is um, um, your desire or your pleasure to either fly these three flags or whether additional flags. And if it's the latter, um, what process would you like to, to have in terms of selecting which flags um, the additional ones should be and could be? So with that, I'm um, requesting um, some direction with, um, with, from you as to how you would like to proceed. Right now, if you drive at the front door, um, the greenery that you see in the new two new flag area has all been um, prepped with um, uh, ready for the flags to be placed. And that work was done last week by our own staff and they, you know, they do an awesome job. I, I can't throw anything at them that they can't do. So this was, they encountered a couple of really big um, tree trunks and they were able to um, address, prep the site so that it's ready for flags. So Commissioner Doan, you have a question. Yeah, uh, just an observation. My understanding is that the U.S. flag has to be conspicuously taller than the other flags. Ah. Uh, and uh, we just need to do that. And if they don't give you a, a percentage, it's just conspicuously taller. I uh, went through that with uh, in basic training. Uh, it's one of those things that is that put into my point. Yeah. So it has we'll to all, uh, We'll work with the, with the um, architects that are helping us out um, to make sure that we meet all of the standards for um, flying okay. flags appropriately. And when we first discussed this, there was, I believe, a preference from at least two of the board members that we fly the rainbow flag. And uh, I would like to, what, make that motion or uh, something. Uh, uh, although I, quite frankly, with three flagpoles, I don't know exactly where you do it. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, I'd like consideration to be given to flying the, uh, the rainbow flag. Thank you, Commissioner Doan. Uh, you do bring up a point that was made uh, about 11 months ago, maybe 10 months ago. Um, can we get some feedback from the other board members on uh, any flags that they would like to see if they have any opinions or um, positions they'd like to take? I would like to see TVWD remember our mission our sole mission as a water district and to not take up causes that are outside of that mission. I would prefer not to fly other flags other than the United States of America flag and of course the POW MIA flag. Yeah, this is Dick. Uh... I agree with that. Uh, I, I, I would 
regardless of, of the rainbow flags connotation, uh, it's not approved or required by the state. So I don't know if I want to fly it or not. Sure. Thank you. Commissioner Duggan. Uh, my feeling on the matter is I, I would like to get more input uh, from the people that are going to be showing up and working at this building on what sort of flags would be appropriate. Um, I was thinking about that uh, yesterday evening when I saw that Elmer's flag and banner in Portland is getting a run on Ukrainian flags. And uh, Given the, the state of the world right now, I would um, want to have a Ukrainian flag um, on our mast uh, to show solidarity with the people of Ukraine that are experiencing such uh, horrendous atrocities against them. Um, but I, I would like to have a, a, a committee of employees um, put up uh, uh, suggested uh, banners that um, are nationally recognized and communicate uh, positive uh, messages. I, I know that other organizations have have had flags, um, uh, uh, banners put up. Uh, the city of Beaverton has had a number of temporary and permanent flags go up, um, but I, I think this is a decision uh, for the board with a lot more input than just us thinking about it a couple nights. Um, I'm really glad that the, the three flag uh, proposal is workable. Um, the, the architect in me is pleased with that picture and I, I'm glad that uh, staff was able to, to find a way to make it work. And I think with the three required flags um, being on, on separate poles, it may, makes a lot of sense. Um, and and I, I think I, I remember in my former handbook training about the uh, flag etiquette that, yeah, the, the, the middle pole with the United States flag has to be either higher or to the left. But uh, neither here nor there, I, I would like to have more input before we decide uh, what banners go on these flags. Um, and I, I think we have time before June for uh, Pride Month to uh, get uh, a rainbow flag um, if if that's what the, the board so desires. But I think we also need to have input for um, any other uh, banners that that uh, uh, might be appropriate for uh, uh, various nationally uh, recognized uh, causes. So um, I, I just think we need, need to make sure that uh, um, we're, we're following the, the etiquette as it relates to uh, flying the banners and, and make sure that we don't uh, get crosswise, like I said, with uh, a good practice. So that's my feeling. I, I think we need more input before we decide um, anything beyond this. Okay. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Duggan. Um, if I may call in our CEO, Tom Hickman. Um, Tom, what has been proposed is perhaps having input from your staff, um, all members of the staff. Is that something that uh, you could facilitate, would be interested in facilitating, or would you prefer this uh, be a decision made purely by the board? So, uh, and I see Carrie's got her hand up, and, and I'm sorry, I I don't. It's, so I I I don't. I want to be respectful and and let her jump in here before I I say something that she's gonna want to. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm just a consultant, so you can say whatever you want to me. But um, I was gonna make a suggestion. Um, we have, you know, as you know, um, the district is embarking on the missions, visions, and values um, project. And there's going to be um, a concerted effort in um, with with that work in terms of um, staff involvement. Um, I need to let my dog out of my office. I am very sorry. Just one very. Well, I, I, I can I can pick up for you because that, that's where I was going to go. Is um, so we we and, and in fact had interviews today, making our final decision tomorrow 
on uh, who we're going to work with um, for our mission, vision, and values work, which will include uh, working with the board. And what I would suggest is maybe we use that process to, um, you know, let's look at our mission, let's look at our vision, and and see what maybe what this can get answered in that venue. Um, you know, I will tell you as as staff, um, you know, th this is one of those things that I I'll I'll just tell you my. I, I'll say from my perspective, it, it, it can be a bit of a slippery slope. Um, I, I worry a little bit um, because, you know, different boards in the future can have a different set of values. Um, and I worry about what choices they could make for what they would want to fly. Um, and that would be different from what is illustrated in this in this uh, graphic here. So um, that that's you know my my concern um, is that you know we could end up in the future if we don't have really tight rules around this. Um, you, you know I worry about. How how do future boards make future decisions on this after we're gone? So I guess maybe what I would encourage is through the work that we're going to do on the mission, vision, and values. If this is something that we want to do, maybe what we do is craft together. We work together to craft policy on on the process of requesting a different flag, or or we we set some sort of guidance and boundaries on that so that we can we can then have something that guides us here better um, rather than just um, at this point picking any one particular flag um, that that this this board is in agreement on because I, I the other piece of this too is so how long do we fly th this flag right I mean is it is it year round is it you know, there's there's a lot of questions and there's other flags too. I mean, even the Ukrainian flag, if we wanted to show, show solidarity, you know, how long do we do that? Um, so there's those kinds of things that I think we should probably think through really carefully. And I think the proper place to do that is as we work through the mission, vision and value work. Um, that's what I would suggest um, at this point in time. Yeah, and, and Tom and I didn't rehearse that but we were apparently on the same wavelength. And, and what I would suggest is that, you know, you can use the work that we're doing right now or we'll be doing to kind of um, get the um, process started. And we can come back to the board at a work session, kind of talk about, you know, here are some process based on um, feedback from staff that we're recommending or options, you know, for how to um, express our values as a district um, in in form of flags, and so I, I think there is an option. I think the having three flagpoles does make it pretty eloquent for three required flags. Um, so you know that's like number one box to check, and I think we can immediately meet that that um, accomplish that objective, and then we can continue to work during the next year or so with this work that Tom and and others are embarking on um, to bring about some other additional values that the district and staff would want to um, display out in public. So that's what I would recommend. Well, thank you to both of you. That's uh, those are good points to be made. Um, I, I'll, I'll say this. I haven't spoken in yet. First of all, um, as I did say last week, flags um, elicit a lot of emotion. They really do. They they symbolize a lot of different things to a to a lot of different people, and um, we do need to be careful of that. Uh, I want to respect um, Commissioner Bagnell's comment in the chat, which was, uh, "This is a water district, not a political platform." Um, my only response to that is, uh, I did not intend um, to any way make uh, support for the LGBT community. Um, to be a political platform. Um, 
but then again, you know, I live in my own personal bubble, uh, which may not um, carry all of the opinions of, of the all of the community. Uh, so I apologize if um, my recommendation was deemed to be uh, political. It wasn't intended to be. My only concern with uh, putting this in with the staff is uh, creating division or derision within the staff if there is a preference one way or the other, or it, it reveals schism or disagreement within the organization, in which case that's why I wanted or I considered making this a board level decision to avoid to avoid that aspect. Um, but maybe, I don't know. Tom, please yeah. help me out here. <laughs> So, you know, I, you can see I'm I'm I I'm doing probably my, the best I can to to avoid having staff weigh in on this. Um, and, and in part um, is because we do have staff that my guess is they would make different choices yeah. or they would make a different request um, or at least an additional request. Right. And. Um, I can think of two or three other flags that they would request. Um, and we start drilling deep down into uh, political views at that point. And so I, I worry about that division. Um, and so I am really trying to keep staff out of this discussion. Um, and would really like to keep staff out of this discussion for that very reason. Um, I, I don't think it's going to benefit the board to have staff start coming to the board and saying, well, I would like this particular flag flown or this particular flag flown and and even members of the public. And um, I think we start to open that door. Um, but if so, what I'm really asking is let the I'm let the board gets to make a, a decision here, certainly, and we will follow the board direction, um, whatever that is, we, we will follow it. But um, I prefer that the rest of our staff beyond myself and, and Carrie, uh, <laughs> I, I prefer the rest of us to just let the board make this call what they think is in the board's best interest and and we will we will comply um and, and but i do think we should probably think about developing some guidance and rules about how the choices are made how others could approach the board um, to make a different choice in the future that that kind of thing I think we should probably think about addressing if we're going to go down this path. All over flags. Uh, so as you were speaking, Tom, um, the thought I had was to propose that we table this discussion um, until we can do some additional research. And then uh, as part of that research, uh, maybe ask for a volunteer or two from our um, a, a volunteer or two from our board membership to uh, research what organizations do with regards to when decisions are made for when flags are raised um, or um, brought down off from the uh, presentation poll. Anybody have any thoughts on any of that? That seems like a good idea for the moment. Uh, this is Dick. I have a question. What is that black flag up there? The uh, that's the POW MIA flag, which is required by the state of Oregon. Oh, okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And we will definitely make sure that the the American flags is you know flown um, um, with all of the flags are flown with uh, appropriate etiquette flag etiquette. I don't know what all those are, but we will make sure that they are followed. Um, so, and you know I I don't know with um, 
Tom's approval. I wish we could um, pass notes without telling everybody. <laughs> but uh, you know, staff can do that research that that um, uh, President Sanders that you have just mentioned. That I mean, we I don't necessarily think that the board has to find a volunteer to. Yeah, no, no, we we can do the research. I just want guidance on it. That's that's right. all I'm asking for is just yeah. just give us guidance uh, on what information you want us to go acquire, and and we can go get that information and bring it back to the board. Okay. Well, then let me ask uh, Commissioner Bagnell, Commissioner Duggan, um, and Commissioner Doan, how do you feel about uh, tabling this motion for the moment, uh, asking um, staff to do some research on what are the standard procedures used at various organizations and government entities with regards to flying flags other than those required by state or federal law? Uh, this is Commissioner Doan. I'm in favor of that. In fact, there's aspects of this that I hadn't even thought of. Yeah, that's and coming I, clear, that, isn't it? And I, I think, yes, and I think that probably the best course of action is do the three flags and then put this off for a couple of years uh, until we've got the budget stuff done. We don't want to add fuel to the fire uh, of people who are 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 going to be, uh, you know, boiling tar out in the parking lot. So I think probably a low profile uh, on this would be uh, fine. On the other hand, a Ukrainian flag wouldn't bother me in the least. Commissioner Bagnell, would you be okay if we tabled this for now and did some more research? You bet. I, my, I have fairly strong feelings against flying any flags other than the United States flag and the POW MIA flag. We're a water district. This is not a political platform. And I don't want it to become a political platform. To respect that, this is this is Dick. Uh, I actually I concur completely with that. We stay out of politics completely. <laughs> Very so, good, and Commissioner Duggan. It all sounds good, and uh, I'm glad staff was able to push back on my suggestion. Um, I raised the white flag, and uh, I think their suggestion is fantastic. So um, I just thought that uh, uh, there might be some other banners out there that might be worthy. But yeah, it is is kind of a situation where um, you don't want uh, uh, anything to be unnecessarily divisive. And uh, that, that's for sure, even though I, I would love to have seen a Ukraine flag under that MIA flag, because I think they represent the same kind of uh, situations. So thank you. So can I get just make quick clarification? I, I heard Commissioner Bagnall mention um, American flag and the POW MIA, um, and I'd like to just make sure that she was okay with the um, state of Oregon flag as well. Oh yes, obviously, of okay, course, I'm, I'm fine with that one. I just, thank you. you know, when we start getting into other flags, that's that's really troublesome for me, and I, I'm not there. I, Tom, I think we have a good set of um, guidance, and so I will just um, exit my presentation now. Yep, I, I think I think we got what we need and uh, we we will move forward accordingly. So we'll we'll have we'll have the American POW uh, state of Oregon POW flags flying and uh, we will table any other discussion on this for for a bit. Um, so. Great, thank you. All right. Uh, that then being the uh, completion of that discussion, and thank you everybody for being open and um, and communicating and talking that through. That was wonderful. Uh, our next item up is an informational presentation. 
And this is an update on the district's financial strategies from Paul Matthews. Well, good evening again, uh, Commissioners, President Sanders. Uh, this is uh, an update on our financial strategy. We've been talking about this for a while and we met with the finance committee and uh, we asked, uh, we, we presented uh, options to them and we asked them for advice. They gave us another option. We have that prepared here tonight. Our goal is to go through that with you here and then we will uh, schedule uh, another session uh, at the April work session to present some more information. So with that, just want to get through uh, uh, this presentation in time and manner because I know we're we're almost out of time here. Uh, but please stop me along the way if there are questions. Uh, really like to answer them as we go along. So our proposed agenda here is to talk about the financial strategies themselves, uh, talk about the effect that inflation is having on our operating expenses, both on the personal services as well as our capital and operating cost. We'll give you an update on the financial uh, forecast to go over some rate options. And then at the end, uh, I have uh, the financial performance of the district. I've presented that to you before. I've got it attached to the end of this presentation. If you have questions, we can go through there. Uh, to the slides, slides 53 and 54 have been updated, but they're not uh, material in any way, uh, the update. Uh, but uh, uh, to save time, I'll just uh, see if you have any questions on that item. In terms of uh, the uh, financial uh, update and the financial strategies, we presented to you in the past uh, uh, quite a bit of information, including the financial risks that we saw as we prepared our various financial uh, strategies. And in fact, some of those risks have uh, have been realized. Uh, chickens have come home to roost, whatever the right uh, saying is there. Uh, but there are some key drivers that uh, we want to talk about. You know, war, energy, and the cost of energy, and other supply chain issues are obviously going to have an effect on us. And the general inflationary uh, cost increases that we saw even before the war uh, have affected the district's financial situation. The inflationary impacts are hitting us on the purchase water. Uh, we're likely to see larger increases from both the Joint Water Commission as well as the City of Portland. Pumping power, our personnel services, professional services and all the other MS costs that we have. And we talked quite a bit already about the impact on the Willamette Water Supply System. Dave Krask and his team has done quite a bit of work to characterize those increases in cost. We have not had an opportunity to do that same in-depth review uh, with the district's uh, CIP, the in-district CIP, but we are working on that uh, as we speak. The information that I'm presenting here is just a, a placeholder until we can get um, uh, more analytical work done. But within the district CIP, we have uh, impacts on our pipeline cost. You heard that uh, just earlier from um, Nick Augustus, but also on our facilities and fleets. And we're looking at the work that Dave Kraska's team did, and we're trying to match uh, that same concept within our CIP, which is we see less of an impact at least for now, on the pipeline projects in terms of cost and more impact on our facilities, and including things like our, our vehicles and heavy equipment, the fleet. So in our financial forecast that we presented to the board and that you approved back in May of 2019, I have listed here the assumptions that we used. Uh, and you can see that we were assuming inflation on the CIP projects, both pipelines as well as other facilities, including fleet, was 3.5%. And over the years, that actually proved to be about right. Uh, we look back and we, we don't hit exactly on, but it uh, long-term average seems about right. More often than not, it was a little lower than that, but that's what we put into our financial forecast. On the o &M side, we used four and a half percent. So as we're looking and moving forward, we're saying, well, we know those numbers aren't correct. We just learned from all the work that uh, the water supply program did that those numbers aren't right. We can anticipate that they aren't right here. And we'll continue to work with uh, our professionals and engineering uh, group. But for now, we've put in there um, into our financial forecast for the next three years, 4% inflation on pipeline projects, 8% inflation. This is each year. So it compound over that three year period for uh, CIP and for O&M. Uh, we don't have uh, really any better numbers than that. And then after that three year period, we'll, we'll uh, assume that it goes back to our uh, our standard inflationary uh, estimates. We may come back to you and say that that was a poor set of assumptions and we'll need to update them, but this is what we have in the plan now. Uh, the other thing that we've done 
uh, in the information I'm about to present is we've increased uh, the interest rate. So our prior assumption was uh, that we would be able to borrow at about three and a half percent, which today, if we went to the market, we probably could get that for a small amount of money. But as we start to borrow additional money and as interest rates go up, uh, by the time we're ready to borrow the money, uh, we're looking at something that could be higher than that. And so we have in there five and a half percent. On this uh, one item, though, I do want to share a bit of good news. Um, I, I think I mentioned earlier that I was at the Oregon Government Finance Officer Association meeting in Sun River um, a few weeks ago, or last week, I guess it was. And I was on a panel presenting um, information about low interest loans. And one of my fe uh, fellow panelists was the underwriter that we worked with from the EPA on our WIFI loan. So I had an opportunity to talk to him and ask, could we have uh, could we pursue another with you loan uh, to cover some of the cost increases within the water supply program? And uh, in fact, uh, we, we can pursue that and we're likely to uh, have an opportunity in May. We're expecting the EPA to issue what's called a NOFA or notice of funding availability. And uh, we will uh, work with our partners to determine uh, whether or not the uh, the district or a set of partners want to pursue uh, that loan. So there is an opportunity for us to do that, and there are some great benefits for the district if we're able to to do that. Now, there's nothing guaranteed about that. It's a competitive process, um, uh, but we'd see where that lies. So we've talked about the WWS challenge. You've heard from uh, Mr. Kraska. You know the details there. I don't need to talk about that, but that has uh, had a dramatic impact on our financial situation. What I'm presenting here is the overall capital improvement plan, and I want to compare really the three numbers that we have here. Uh, the gray bars that you see there, the first bars, present the uh, uh, what the CIP that we had in the financial plan that you approved back in May of 2021. Uh, the blue bars is the information that we presented to you in uh, for our January forecast, and that includes the information from the water supply program itself. And then the uh, these red hash bars, we're using hash bars to make it um, stand out a little bit better for, for folks, uh, is the information that we have now, uh, assuming the increases in the in-district CIP that we talked about. So looking down at the bottom of the table, you can see that our total CIP through 2026 has gone up by a little bit, uh, you know, but let's say about $3 million. Uh, not as not a lot, and and the reason that it is is not a lot is because we don't have much in district CIP. We by design purposefully pushed a lot of our CIP out in past 2026, uh, and the CIP that we have here are really those projects that are that are absolutely critical. So uh, the that gray bar at the bottom, that 29 million, 28 million, 22 million. There just isn't a lot of those projects really to drive our our cost up, but we did want to include that in the forecast. Um, so if we look at our uh, capital financing plan, um, given the assumptions that we have on our O and M cost and the in district CIP as well as the new cost from the water supply program, uh, this is roughly how it would roll out in terms of our funding with cash. In the green, uh, the dark uh, bar would be our existing WIFI loan. And then the teal color, the blue there, is uh, overall borrowing that we would have. And we're assuming from the revenue bond market, uh, and we'll we'll have to see if we can, in fact, get a with you loan for that additional amount. Uh, but th there you can see the, the dollars. Now, would we borrow it in that order? Uh, maybe not. So we are meeting with our municipal advisor and with our partners, Hillsborough and Beaverton, to discuss the opportunity not only for with you loan, but also an overall strategy. It could be that we're in a better position to borrow some money now and use that to fund the program. Uh, but there are a lot of considerations there um, with negative arbitrage and some other things. I don't want to get into the details, but it may or may not be in the district's interest when we look at it from a strictly financial position to borrow early. But we do always want to check that assumption to make sure that we are, in fact, uh, making the right decisions. So what impact does that have on on our borrowing. Uh, when we brought the financial plan to uh, the board back last May, we were planning to borrow about $408 million. And if you think about that, we have 388 from WIFI, another $20 million, and we're done. Now, uh, with these assumptions, 
we're at about six hundred and eleven million dollars, which is um, quite a bit more than we had. So we're we're on the hunt for a couple hundred million dollars in our plan. And uh, in terms of our long term debt, uh, the bond ordinance itself that the board passed uh, authorized us to spend up to six hundred million dollars. And uh, we are not uh, now at all proposing that uh, we adjust that number. Uh, if we get to the point where we are going to borrow that, we would come to the board and um, ask for authorization. But when you look at a plan that has $611 million and you look at a number of $600 million, that's just a couple of good summers of water sales that will, in fact, fill that hole. So it's it just simply is too early to make any determination about that. And, and the good news is we don't have to make that decision right now, but I do want to present to you that that is something something that we may be uh, considering in the future. Uh, the other thing that we've talked about in the, uh, in the past and still is uh, is relevant to our discussions here this evening is the impact on our net borrowing, our net leverage rather. And I'm not going to get into all the details here, but this is the, the financial metric that constrains the district. It's not the debt service coverage, it's our, our net leverage, which means that it's our total amount of borrowing that our, our income can support. We want to borrow more, we have to increase our income so that that ratio uh, is in line. Our policy is to stay within eight. If we adopt something above that, I'll be coming back and we'll adjust that policy. Uh, industry standard is, is seven. You might say, well, why would we have a policy that exceeds what you're calling the industry standard? And why would we actually have a plan that exceeds both? And the issue there is uh, we have a narrative. We have a, a story that we can tell about how we're going to bring that net leverage down um, with our uh, by getting off our uh, our expenses off the Portland system and so forth. And so I think uh, that doesn't put the district's uh, credit at risk. Uh, we also presented this information before, and you might remember last time I showed you this chart, I said we were looking for $12 million and we we're borrowing about 200 million. Well, with all the increases that we're now including the financial plan for the O&M cost, as well as uh, those capital items, that eats into our, our PAYGO cash, the amount of money that we have to, to fund our capital expenditures on a pay-as-you-go basis. So we're now looking at uh, about $215 million. And the other thing is, by increasing the assumed interest rate, that then means that the debt services is even higher. But the same thing applies here. If we're looking for $16 million, uh, and the point that I made uh, the last time you looked at this slide, we can't get that out of any one item, whether it's our material service budget, our personnel services budget, or in district CIP. I'm not going to go through the risk of the forecast. We've gone through that together before. Uh, I think that you're well aware of those things, but uh, just as a disclaimer, uh, we always want to make sure that people understand these numbers. We present more decimal points than we're really rightfully should have a privilege of presenting. So take it all with a grain of salt uh, because these things are out of our control. They're alive and they're out there in the real world. Uh, some of them can cut in our favor. Some of them will uh, cut against us, but the risks of the forecast still exist. So we've uh, uh, presented uh, several options in the past. These are the uh, four options uh, that the status quo, which is what we had in the 21-23 financial plan that you approved back in August, I'm sorry, in May, and then the three options, uh, A, B, and C. Uh, and I'm just gonna step into the numbers because we actually have a fourth, uh, that fourth option, which is the, um, this is not the right slide. What happened to my, okay. So these are the, I'm sorry uh, for the hiccup here in my presentation. These these are the results that we presented to you with just the WWS only impacts. To that, we've added one more scenario. Uh, and that is, uh, these are updated numbers with the, with the new assumptions on our operating expenses and our um, capital costs. As you can see, uh, the numbers have gone up. So let me go back and show you what I'm talking about. I'm, we had about a 15% rate increase under option A, and now we're looking at a 19% increase under option A. And then we added an option D. Uh, so let's step through these one at a time. Option A would be do nothing. Right now, the board has already approved the 9.5% rate increase that would go into effect this November, no action taken. If that were the case, then we'd be looking at, if we stayed on a biennial basis, uh, we'd be looking at two increases 
at about 19% uh, in the coming two year period. Uh, option B uh, would be let's take action this November. We do about a 14% rate increase this November, and then it would be 14% would be our estimate. Again, with all those risks of the forecast still out there walking around, uh, be another 14% over the next um, uh, next biennium. So that is smoothed out over a three year period. Option C would be leave the existing rate increase in place for this fall, but uh, look at doing these on an every six month basis. This was a recommendation that came from one of the members of your finance committee, and so we modeled that out. And so that would be about 7% rate increases every six months. And of course, we'd review these numbers each period and readjust them as we step through time and we realize the actual expenses uh, that we have in our, our long-term forecast. And then the last one that we added would be take action this year at a 14% uh, increase. And that was just simply to be parallel to option B and then move to a every six months starting in May of 2023. Uh, and the lower panel that you see here, uh, the lower panel presents what the monthly bill impacts would be. Uh, and so for those that have uh, the monthly impacts, you would, I'm sorry, have the every six, every six month uh, increases, you would then see an increase in May of 2025. The rest would then be in May of 2024. So uh, this lays out what the impact would be on that typical customer. It's the same typical customer we've talked about in the past. That's a customer consuming seven, Hundred cubic feet of water in a month with five eighths by three quarter inch meter single family residential customer. So that gives you that impact. I, I do want to present one slide. I want to actually thank Commissioner Doan to raising this issue in an email exchange that we had, uh, which is where were we uh, in terms of the typical bill back when we presented this in 2017. So I went back to the 2017 forecast, which is what we used during the rate advisory committee process. And uh, you can see there that at that time we were forecasting increases about 12 and a half percent per year and that the typical bill was going to get up by the end of the program at the end of this uh, 2025 period to about one hundred and four dollars. Uh, we're no, nowhere through all the construction risks. We're nowhere through all the financing risks, but even with uh, the plan that we're presenting here that we'd be still about ten dollars under what we presented in. 2017. So I appreciate uh, uh, that um, uh, thought and thought it was worth putting into a chart and presenting it to you here tonight. Uh, with that, uh, that uh, concludes the information I was presenting as part of this. I'm uh, available to answer any questions or take any additional guidance so that we can come back in April if, um, if you want us to do further analysis. Paul, this is this is Jim Doan. If we decide to do things differently than we've told the budget committee, do we have to reconvene the budget committee? Uh, that's a great question. No, we don't need to. We don't technically need to. There's no organ requirement or a local budget law requirement that would require that we reconvene the budget committee because the budget committee uh, appropriates money, and this is actually a revenue, so uh, we don't have to. Having said that, it's not a bad practice uh, to keep the budget committee informed. And and you will remember, Commissioner Dome, when you were on the rate advisory committee, that we uh, you were the liaison from the board, one of the two liaisons from the board. We actually had Craig Hopkins uh, from the budget committee on the rate advisory committee too. So keeping them informed and apprised of this is uh, a good practice but it is not required uh, under Oregon local budget law. How about the rate advisory committee? We're under what we told them in 2017. Would that be, uh, I mean, I'm not saying do it or don't do it. I'm saying legally, do we have to do it? No, uh, there's no legal requirement to do that. The only legal requirement you have is we have to send a notice to our customers no more than 30 days prior to you having a public hearing to adopt rates. So that's uh, now we will have a public outreach that's going to be considerably more in depth than that because that's a best practice and our customers deserve that. We do want the rate advisory committee to look 
in depth at our rate design and some of the issues about affordability. Actually, Tom has his hand up. I'll, I'll, Tom, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, well, I, I just uh, want to remind that um, as part of the Thursday memo, we, we have been informing uh, both the board and the budget committee about these increases as part of the Thursday memo. I do think we need to take one additional step um, as we clarify what actions we're actually going to take here. Um, I, I think we need to probably invite the board, the uh, the budget committee um, to a board meeting um, to this kind of a meeting and just just let them know that we are taking this action and and why and give them a chance just because I think it's really good practice um, to do that. So I, I I'm strongly encouraging that's the approach we take. Um, and then again with the rate advisory committee, I think informing you know the members have changed. Um, the the, uh, the many of the people um, I think Paul you can correct me, but many yeah. of the members aren't the same. Well, so technically, uh, the rate advisory committee that we had was uh, an ad hoc committee that was that ceased to exist once they delivered the recommendation to the board. So we do not have a rate advisory committee. We need to create one, and we, we want to talk to the board about that in April. The other thing I would suggest is uh, if I, I really agree totally with what uh, uh, what Tom said there in terms of working with the budget committee. It's part of using their you know using their advice to help us and it's also keeping them informed and building that uh relationship uh, it may be a good time to bring them to a work session so that it's more informal and we can have more of a dialogue with them and they can ask their questions especially around the cost increases um paul this is this is jim dowd again do we have time to do all the steps we have to do to do uh, a higher rate increase in November? Um, we we wouldn't get it. It wouldn't be the ideal situation because uh, so let me answer the question. Yes, we can do it. Uh, we would structure our public outreach so that we could have open houses in July. We would have a public hearing probably in August. And uh, August and September, we like to have that two meeting to allow people to come at the open house and then to make public testimony. And then uh, you make a final decision in in September after you've had a chance to hear the uh, the input from the customers. So we have time to do that. But what where we get pinched, Commissioner Doan, is that ideally we'd really like to have the rate advisory committee going along with us and providing the board its advice and its recommendations and i don't think we can do that because we need to create the rate advisory committee we sure. need to bring that to the board the board would appoint them approve a charter and by the time we do all that work we would already be bringing a proposal however if the rate advisory committee's scope if their charter was to look at affordability issues and rate design issues the fix versus the volume charge and whether or not we should be looking at how frequent the rate increases should we do it every six months those things we could get the rate advisory committee up and running and get recommendations prior to may of 2023 so we could have a public process in the spring of 23 to prepare that so i think it's in our interest to convene to create a rate advisory committee uh, obviously we'll need the board's help to do that and we'll we'll present uh, information on that to you and the board will appoint those members as well as appoint again the liaison from the board to the rate advisory committee. Um, we need to get consultants selected and underway. So there's work to be done in that, uh, but I think we can do that and hit that May date and have the rate advisory committee help us in May. The other thing we want to sync this up with is the CIS project. So as the CIS project is going live, uh, which which is probably going to be the end of this fiscal year um, in the beginning of the next fiscal year. Uh, that's really not a good time to turn to our our customer service team and say, can you implement a new rate design uh, as they're trying to go on the go live? So we want to wait until they get through the post go live stabilization 
and uh, Andrew Carlstrom can speak more authoritatively on that issue, but we need to coordinate closely with our with our CIS team to make sure that we're not getting kitty wampus on on that, or is it catty wampus? Whatever the wampus is, we don't want to get there. Right. Well, well, thank you, Paul. I appreciate your uh, your sage advice on this, and and uh, uh, certainly a rate advisory committee, I think, would help the uh, the board uh, substantially uh, in sale in say excuse me in sailing save anyway in in selling the uh the product to our constituents thank you yes i I'd, I'd like to uh just ask quickly if andrea if you have any other um i spoke quite a lot on this and it's i just wonder if andrea watson has anything she'd like to add before No, just we're on board to facilitate whichever direction we get. We'll get the input and the engagement from our customers that we need. Thank you, Andrew. That's all I had on this, unless you want me to talk about the financial performance and the goal of that is always to be included in your packet and just see if you have any questions. Uh, oh, thank you, Dave. Uh, Dave Kraska explained to me it's Caddy Wampus, so I. I will adjust my uh, my understanding of that word. It's catty wampus. But in any event, if you have any questions about that, otherwise, I uh, this completes my formal presentation. All right, thank you, Paul. And I think catty wampus is like a twenty point word in Scrabble, at least. Um, unless there are no other questions for Paul or for Tom, or I think Andrea was called in here at the last second for also, um, if there are no other questions, um, there would be no further business before the board and the meeting will be adjourned. Uh, commissioners are reminded and the applicable staff members are